WorkSafe is pleased to bring in Dr. Paul Demers to speak to you all today on such an important topic as asbestos. According to current research, thousands of Canadians are still regularly exposed to asbestos through their employment. While there is an increased awareness of the hazards of asbestos exposure, it is still likely that workers will continue to be exposed to putting them at high risk. High risk. And not only workers, but uh, people doing uh, their own renovations. Um, in the last two or three months, I've talked to several people who have told me about renovating their old house and not even thinking about this issue. So raising awareness about this topic is very important. Asbestos is the leading cause of work-related deaths in the province of Saskatchewan. As of September, there have been 25 fatalities in the province, and 11 of those are asbestos exposure-related deaths. In the past 10 years, occupational diseases have accounted for an average of 36% of the workplace fatalities. That is why WorkSafe remains committed to providing information on this topic. If we can eliminate the current exposure, we can prevent and eliminate future deaths from occurring. I will call on Dr. Sean Tucker to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Paul Demers. Uh, good morning, everyone. A uh, very warm welcome, and thanks for uh, coming this morning. This morning, we're meeting on Treaty 4 territory. This is the traditional uh, lands of the Cree, Nakoda, Lakota, and Dakota and also the homeland of the Métis people. I want to also thank Annette Newman, who greeted you as you came in the door. Annette, thank you for all your efforts in organizing today's events. Much appreciated. Thank you. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Paul Demers with us this morning. Um, if you don't know Paul, uh, he is, he's Canada's leading expert on occupational disease and internationally recognized for his expertise on the topic. Paul is director of the Occupational Cancer Research Centre in Toronto. He's also a senior scientist in prevention, screening and cancer control at Cancer Care Ontario, a professor with the Dalla School of Public Health at the University of Toronto, and he also has an affiliation as a professor at UBC. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Demir. Well, thanks for that nice introduction, and uh, thanks for the invitation here, and thanks for arranging uh, really quite nice weather. I thought it'd be a bit chillier here. Uh, anyway, I'm very happy to be here today. Um, I wanted to say just a word or two about our, uh, the center uh, that I have in Toronto. Uh, the Occupational Cancer Research Center is based uh, out of our Provincial Cancer Agency and also gets funded by our Provincial Ministry of Labor. Uh, as well received some funds from our Workers' Compensation Board, the WSIB. Uh, but we also are funded by the Canadian Cancer Society, uh, and that funds some of our national work because we see ourselves as both a provincial and a national centre uh, in the work that we do. So I'd like to thank the Cancer Society for that. Okay. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of asbestos exposure in Canada. Uh, some of you may know uh, pieces of this, uh, but hopefully uh, I'll be uh, showing some information that uh, you haven't heard. Um, I'll talk about the current health impact of asbestos and how that's uh, grown over time, the ban and its potential impact on uh, the future of asbestos-related disease, uh, but the continued need for prevention as we go forward. Um, I want to say that if anybody has any questions as we go along, please uh, interrupt me. Um, you can raise a hand, you can yell if I don't hear anything, or even throw something at me if I'm really not paying attention. But it's uh, probably better to ask questions as we go along. We have enough time uh, to do that here today. And if you have a question in your mind, it's probably in other people's minds as well. I'm starting with uh, this uh, advertisement for John's Mansville, uh, which was the primary producer of asbestos in Canada. They owned uh, the mines in uh, 
in most of the areas of the country. Um, they were certainly one of the biggest targets for uh, the lawsuits that eventually came down uh, on, uh, on asbestos later on. Uh, this ad is about uh, a little over 100 years ago now. Um, it was in Scientific American, and it was, I don't know if you can read it well from back there, the fire and time defiant mineral of many marvels. Um, and in fact, it is quite an amazing mineral in terms of its commercial use. Um, I'll also say that many people think that asbestos is a mineralogical term. It's not. It's a commercial term. It's a commercial term for six very similar minerals uh, that have similar properties in terms of uh, resistance uh, to heat and to wear and tear and things like that. Uh, but it actually doesn't cover everything uh, that we might call asbestos if we were looking at it from a mineralogical point of view. And I'll mention why that's important a little bit later. But even at the time that this ad came out, uh, there were people that were aware that there were health impacts uh, of asbestos. Uh, as early as the late 1800s, I've read reports from workplace inspectors in the UK who knew that this was bad news, that people were suffering uh, lung disease from this. At the time, they didn't, there wasn't even a word for asbestosis. Uh, that didn't come till later, uh, but that was certainly, uh, people were aware of it even back uh, when these ads were coming out. Now, we think often of asbestos as being uh, at least in Canada, uh, a mineral that comes out of Quebec. And this is a, a picture from Asbestos Quebec, uh, uh, certainly aptly named. The major employer there is the asbestos industry, a huge mine there. Um, in case you're worried, that's snow on the ground, not asbestos. Uh, but it did produce a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the country's asbestos over time. But um, this map, or this kind of graph, is a little bit deceptive, but what you see here is the production of asbestos in Canada, and the blue line is Quebec. Uh, and the smaller kind of squiggly things at the bottom are the other provinces. But if you stack those other provinces on top, uh, you'd see that it wasn't trivial, the amount of asbestos that was also coming out of British Columbia, uh, and Newfoundland, uh, and then to a lesser extent, the Yukon and Ontario over time. Um, and uh, particularly, there were some large mines in northern uh, British Columbia and as well in uh, uh, um, Bayvert, uh, Newfoundland. Um, I made the mistake of pronouncing that with a French accent the first time I went there. They thought I was in the wrong town. Uh, but that was another major mine that produced uh, a lot of asbestos over time. So if we map out asbestos across Canada, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of naturally occurring deposits, uh, which have become an environmental issue in some areas of the states. Uh, we don't yet talk about it here. Um, you see uh, red dots there for mines. Now, the biggest mines, of course, were in uh, Quebec. Uh, but you see the location of some of the other ones there. Even in Ontario, we had some mines. They were not big, uh, but they were probably some of the worst in the country while they existed. Uh, and you also see some kind of light blue dots. I always have to make sure that we're getting the same color on my screen as your screen. Uh, but that light blue is places where uh, Libby vermiculite was uh, exported from Montana into Canada. Uh, and uh, from about 1967 to about 1986, there were you know, roughly 16,000 tons of, of uh, Libya vermiculite that were um, shipped to uh, Regina, or in this area anyway. I could probably find the address if I needed to. Um, we managed to get data from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency uh, on where Libya wa Libby, um, vermiculite was shipped. Now, for those of you who aren't aware, Libby vermiculite was contaminated with asbestos. Uh, it was actually contaminated with a small amount of tremolite, and that's often what you hear about, is that small percentage of tremolite. But in fact, it was about 15% uh, different uh, minerals that if we were a mineralogist, we would call asbestos, and in fact, uh, a lot more than the amount that was just officially asbestos. The problem is we don't regulate these other things because our regulations are written as asbestos. So um, it's one reason that Libya vermiculite is a lot more potent 
uh, in terms of causing asbestos-related lung disease uh, than people would assume from the small amount of uh, tremolite that was, uh, that was in it. And it's an issue that we often forget um, in uh, basically when we're thinking about all the other asbestos that was produced in Canada and used in a lot of different products. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, vermiculites, particularly in uh, people's um, the ceilings of people's homes that is contaminated with uh, asbestos and it's something we have to continue to be vigilant on. Now we also imported not a huge amount of asbestos but we continued to import asbestos into Canada until really just uh, probably just stopped last year uh, with the ban that happened uh, at the very end of December. Um, most of that uh, came in the form of friction products, that is uh, stuff for brake pads, uh, perhaps clutch pads and other types of commercial uses. So that's the, uh, that's the, uh, the pink lines there, or maybe that's pink, I'm not sure what the color is. Uh, but there are other types of products that came in. Um, hopefully that's not for me. But it's just to say that we did continue to import asbestos even after our mines closed. And we even started to import uh, asbestos fibers after the mines uh, uh, kind of closed. And they really didn't totally close until the ban happened in that they still could have been reopened. But they ceased operation some, uh, some uh, I don't know, in the last three, four years or so. This is, a, this is something that when I was a professor at the University of British Columbia, I got from our Health, and, health Safety and Environment Department. But it's a, a thing to remind us that, you know, we can ban the new uses of asbestos, but a lot of asbestos exists out there in our buildings. And these are different kinds of uses uh, where asbestos uh, uh, exists in different buildings. Um, this exists in people's homes, as was mentioned. Uh, earlier when, I, uh, when we were starting this session, but it's also uh, found in uh, lots of other uh, public buildings and workplaces. Uh, an issue that I've been working on recently is uh, asbestos in schools, and pretty much any school that we have that was built from about the uh, mid-1970s or earlier is going to have substantial amounts of asbestos in it. Uh, to the point where if there's a leak in a ceiling and a ceiling comes down, you know, they basically have to hit the fire alarm, everybody has to leave because they're worried about asbestos contaminating the schools. So this is going to continue to be an issue with us for some time, uh, and we need to uh, be thinking about that. Um, now the current uses of asbestos that were impacted by the ban, I've kind of got highlighted in reddish. Uh, over here where it says 2018 and that is brakes, cement pipes and some cement uh, boards that we were still using and putting into buildings um, uh, even in downtown Toronto uh, as recently as the last couple of years uh, in building some of the major uh, high-rises. So these were still being used, there were still brake pads being imported our auto industry ceased using asbestos-containing brake pads uh, you know, quite some time ago, decades ago, uh, because they recognized uh, the issues that were there, uh, and they stopped putting them into new cars, and it's simply these imported brakes uh, that were not manufactured here uh, in Canada because we manufacture brakes that don't have asbestos in them, uh, that were containing asbestos that we were continuing to use, and we have to continue to be vigilant about going forward. I realize I don't always talk that loud. People can hear me even in the back? Okay, thank you. Now I mentioned earlier that we've known about the health effects of asbestos for a very long time. Uh, and this is from a report that I worked on uh, with the U.S. Institute of Medicine um, uh, some years ago. We were looking at uh, where the evidence is for uh, really different uh, types of cancer and uh, the relationship with asbestos. But it's, a, it's one that I like to use because it, it surprises some people uh, and really disappoints some people. Uh, I was speaking in front of a group of uh, retired uh, asbestos miners in Newfoundland uh, some years ago and they were 
uh, quite upset by this. But even the managers of their plant, uh, which were residents of the community, didn't know uh, how much was known at the time that that uh, mine was being operated about the health effects. Uh, Really, there was, starting in the 1920s, attempts to suppress uh, what we knew there. So the term asbestosis uh, started appearing in the medical literature, I think, in around 1927, uh, and then disappeared uh, as papers didn't get published for, for quite some time. Uh, lung cancer, we began having suspicions as early as the 1930s. Uh, mesothelioma, the 1940s, other cancers, the 1950s. But really, lung cancer was very solid by the 1950s uh, in terms of where the scientific community was. Um, uh, and yet still, uh, we continued to um, mine and use huge amounts of asbestos until uh, lawsuits kind of hit and, uh, and stopped that, uh, uh, that use, um, at least in uh, North America. Uh, in a lot of different uses uh, around the mid-1970s or early 1970s. So the legacy of that um, you see here, this is the number of new cases uh, diagnosed uh, annually uh, or each year in the different provinces. Now it jumps around. This is a rare cancer. It's not the it's not a doesn't form into a straight line. Although I'll show you some straight lines that were calculated late um, uh, in a minute. Um, certainly, what you see here is a lot of new cases arising in Ontario and uh, in Quebec. Uh, Quebec has about uh, two thirds the population of Ontario, but you see that it's fairly similar in its number of mesothelioma claims or not claims. These are cases, uh, and. Um, that's uh, because of how much of the asbestos industry was based in that province. You see a little circle with a question mark there, uh, and we, there's some problem going on in, uh, right now where we're not getting data out of Quebec, not just for mesothelioma, but for overall for their uh, cancer. But I know that the number is still climbing there. Uh, they're just kind of evaluating uh, some quality control issues in their tumor <coughs> registry. Now the climb looks less dramatic in some of the other provinces here, but still what you see even in Saskatchewan, which is the kind of oh, aqua or I can't, I don't know, maybe teal. I'm very bad on colors, I'm a bit colorblind. Uh, the color there at the bottom. So you could still see that it's, the numbers are small, but it has doubled over this same period uh, when other provinces have been rising as well. Now, this is just a, some graphs that we've been trying to uh, get some of the data out of uh, Statistics Canada for all the different tumor registries. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, Statistics Canada only allows you to uh, take out data that meets certain size requirements. So we've had to hear uh, where it says prairies, that's actually uh, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Uh, and so we had to combine those, but a fairly similar pattern where you see uh, a slower increase in the number of cases over time. Um, and uh, you see, uh, if you just drew a straight line, how much it's increasing in uh, Quebec and Ontario, which are driving the national numbers. Oops. And let's see. Now, these are incidence rates, not numbers of cases. And uh, they jump around a lot. The other ones that I was showing you were a bit what we call smooth. So we basically take the average of three years to try to get a, a little bit straighter line. But you can see here that they, they do jump around a bit. The rates you can see are much higher in Quebec because of their large asbestos industry. Um, what you see here is um, if you look for Ontario, which is kind of the light green, it's kind of in the middle, um, that's around where the national rates have been. And um, so you see the ones that are higher are actually uh, Quebec and British Columbia, uh, whereas uh, the other ones tend to be a little bit lower than the national average. But again, when you adjust these things for rates, and Canada's a growing country, we have a lot more people than we did uh, 20 years ago, uh, we're still seeing these kind of increases. <clears throat> 
Now, I'm going to apologize for this. Another project that we have is trying to look at uh, mesothelioma as a disease and try to look to see if we're getting any better in terms of survival. Mesothelioma is uh, one of our, our worst cancers in terms of survival. Um, people usually don't survive a year. Uh, and. Uh, I'm going to apologize. This was generated by uh, one of the students in our group, um, and we didn't have a chance to put this into a thing that's more easy to see, see, but I'm going to show you a little summary of it. But basically what this says is, if you look on the left-hand side, um, this is when people get diagnosed, and that's the proportion that are left alive as you follow them forward in months. And so when you get out to five years, that's how few people are alive uh, who were diagnosed with mesothelioma. So this is a terrible disease, um, uh, and we're not making a lot of progress with it. Mean survival, that is the average time that uh, people uh, survive uh, mesothelioma is about nine months from diagnosis. Uh, only 14% survived to two years, about 5% uh, survived to five years. Um, this is a calculation based upon Ontario. I don't think we're that uh, different. The reason we're using Ontario is that one of the advantages of being based in a cancer registry is I don't have to use StatsCan. I can actually access the data directly and we have a lot more cases. Uh, but we don't see real good evidence of improvement over time. Uh, and that's kind of depressing. Canada has made a lot of strides in improving survival for things like uh, lung cancer, colorectal cancer, where we sit as one of the better countries in the world for that. Uh, but mesothelioma, that's not the case. Um, if we could diagnose mesothelioma in an earlier stage, survival would definitely improve. Um, we see somewhat better survival for women uh, people diagnosed uh, at a younger age, uh, a thing called epithelioid uh, mesothelioma, so a subtype of mesothelioma. Uh, we don't see any impact for income. It's pretty uh, equal uh, opportunity killer, um, which is uh, perhaps uh, the only area of justice with, uh, with this disease. And one thing we were looking at was whether or not people diagnosed in more remote areas have a lower chance of survival. Uh, than people uh, diagnosed in urban areas. And we don't see that, at least in Ontario. But that's been a concern that we don't actually have specialized treatment facilities for mesothelioma uh, in all cities around the country. Now, I've talked a lot about mesothelioma. And mesothelioma is the most obvious cancer due to asbestos. Almost all mesothelioma is due to asbestos. It's the only... Uh, the only cause of asbestos that we know of is, or only cause of mesothelioma that we know of is asbestos, and asbestos-like minerals, things like fibrous uh, zeolite and some other things that are much rarer here uh, in, uh, in Canada as minerals, but they're very, very similar. Uh, and there really isn't good evidence for anything else causing mesothelioma. Um, roughly 80% of mesothelioma is right now, let's say 80 to 85%, are due to workplace exposures, but over time we're going to see a gradual increase to being uh, uh, cancers that are caused by environmental exposure um, as we hopefully reduce occupational exposure. But in different studies of North American uh, asbestos workers, what we see is that for every case of mesothelioma, you see approximately five excess cases of lung cancer. We don't normally count those as well because uh, you know, most lung cancers we attribute to cigarette smoking and things like that. We don't recognize necessarily that even among cigarette smokers, many of the people who are exposed to asbestos and cigarette smoking would not have gotten uh, lung cancer uh, if they were not exposed to one or the other. So um, we're not catching a lot of those, certainly not in our compensation data. And it's the only way that we can estimate them, basically, is to predict them with statistical models. But it's important to recognize that 
there are a lot more cases of lung cancer. And lung cancer is also not a cancer that we have great survival with. To try to estimate the full impact of, of uh, different workplace exposures on cancer, uh, some years ago we started a project called the Burden of Occupational uh, Cancer Project with uh, funding from uh, the Canadian Cancer Society um, and a team of uh, people from across the country who are uh, experts in uh, exposure and in epidemiology, um, as well as in statistics. Uh, and this is what we're estimating uh, approximately annually across the country for mesothelioma related to work. About 430 cases of uh, mesothelioma uh, due to work. Um, almost all these in uh, people who work directly, but they're also, we've included in this uh, uh, women and family members who would have gotten it from a family member taking asbestos home with them, uh, which is an unfortunate thing and a kind of a tragic thing for some families where uh, you not only lose uh, the people who worked in the asbestos facility, but family members to uh, some horrible uh, diseases. And you see here about uh, um, 1,900 overall uh, lung cancers per year um, due to uh, asbestos across the country, um, smaller numbers of laryngeal and ovarian, um, and uh, as well, it's hard to estimate, but stomach cancers and colorectal cancers as well. And we think that in Canada still about 150,000 or more people are kind of regularly encountering asbestos at work. And this is probably conservative. It's a matter of where you draw the line. Um, you know, some of these folks that we're counting here, or the majority of these folks, are people in the construction sector where their uh, job is to um, uh, basically uh, repair or update different buildings uh, and we know that they're going to regularly encounter uh, asbestos. But we don't, for instance, count a lot of our custodians or uh, people who are uh, the skill trades who work for our school systems. And although they may not encounter asbestos every day, uh, they do uh, encounter uh, asbestos uh, in the workplace. Um, when they have to maintain our schools and they go to places uh, that uh, the teachers and the students hopefully don't go, which is behind the walls and in the ceilings uh, where asbestos occurred. I know in Ontario, the one thing that we did um, uh, to remediate uh, asbestos in uh, schools was to remove the lagging around pipes. And indeed, that was smart. That's the most easy place for asbestos to get loose. Uh, and so that was removed, uh, and that was very expensive, and it stopped there. Um, and uh, I think we have a long ways to go still. But that's just to say that there's this 150,000 doesn't include everybody who ever encounters asbestos. Now, part of our burden of cancer project was also to look at the economic costs of this. Um, and uh, you know, that's in part because economic costs also speak uh, to some people in terms of uh, what the impact of this is, but also uh, tell us that if you think prevention is expensive, you should think about what the cost of not preventing is. Uh, so each year we're estimating uh, over $2 billion in economic costs uh, associated uh, with asbestos caused mesothelioma and lung cancer alone. Um, and you see the breakdown here. This is how an economist, uh, and this was led by Emil uh, Tampa, who's a very good uh, economist based at the Institute for Work and Health. Uh, that was a, one of our collaborators, and so his team did this work. Um, you see here the, the kind, of, kind of darker slice here. Um, is healthcare and administrative costs. That would include things like workers' compensation as a small percentage of it, uh, but also uh, the treatment uh, of, uh, of the disease, uh, caregiving and out-of-pocket costs to family members, uh, output and productivity to the economy, and health-related quality of life. So that's years of life uh, lost uh, 
and cost it out the way an economist would do it, which is the majority of the costs here. So what you see here uh, is that there is enormous cost associated with, uh, with uh, cancer associated with uh, asbestos in Canada. Asbestosis is another thing that we don't keep uh, extremely good track of. Um, compensation boards keep track of compensated cases, but we don't actually monitor it in the general population. Um, this is asbestos incident, asbestosis incidents uh, in Canada um, from hospital discharge data. Um, and um, it's looking at different types of pneumoconiosis, that is scarring of the lungs from the inhalation of uh, coal dust, silica, uh, different types of fibers and dusts. Um, and the red line there is, uh, is asbestosis. Um, the top line is silicosis. And you can see for silicosis, uh, the, the cases of silicosis that are being seen in hospitals have been dropping um, over time dramatically. That's true here. That's true in the United States. That's true in our mortality data as well. Um, but asbestosis has not been. Um, it's been uh, rather level or, if anything, a bit going up. Um, when we've analyzed this in British Columbia, uh, we see very much the same thing. Um, uh, that in fact, even though we're making progress on the other types of lung diseases that are occupational, uh, we're not making that uh, for asbestosis. So the full health impact of asbestos in Canada is uh, about what you see here. Uh, now this is asbestos at work, um, 500 new cases, uh, well, actually, 500 new cases overall of mesothelioma or more being diagnosed in Canada each year, and it is growing. It's probably closer to 600 now um, than when we were using our benchmark for this around 2011, uh, and about 85% of those are work-related, uh, the rest being environmental. Um, lung cancers due to work, about 1,900. Um, I have the economic costs that I've already talked about, the other cancers. There's about 80 silicosis, oh, so that should be asbestosis, sorry, shouldn't do slides late at night. Uh, asbestosis cases uh, annually in Canada uh, per year, but there's probably thousands of people out there with some degree of lung scarring uh, due to asbestos exposure. So this is the kind of impact that we're living with. And it's really due to asbestos exposure that has occurred uh, really over decades. And when you saw that uh, dramatic increase of asbestos use that peaked in the 1970s, uh, this is the cost of it that we'll be paying for for a while. Now, in Ontario, again, because I have direct access to the tumor registry data, uh, we can actually map out and see where cases are arising. Um, and uh, it's tried to give, it's given us some, I guess, some information in terms of where to worry about uh, existing cases of uh, not only where the cases are, but where there might still be exposure. Um, some of these are around notorious facilities such as uh, near Sarnia, where the Holmes Foundry uh, existed and uh, was a very uh, horrible place for uh, generating asbestos-containing um, uh, insulation materials. Um, and there's some other hot spots there. That's just to say that when you do have access to the direct tumor registry, uh, then you can begin to look at these things and sometimes be able to do more with it. The other thing we've tried to look at in Ontario is to think more about where are we in the asbestos epidemic. This we just generated in the last few days, and I think it's a little, we have to kind of work on it a little bit, but what it's saying is uh, that in Ontario, uh, we may have actually hit um, the uh, peak of our uh, um, mesothelioma epidemic. That is the rising number of cases of mesothelioma uh, 
the rates appear to have plateaued off and even appear to be dropping, although we need to verify that with the most recent years. So that's very good news. It's not true in Quebec, we don't think, but we're going to be running models like this uh, for some of the other provinces to be able to take a look at it. Uh, but this is the hoped for effect. Now I'll say that in the Nordic countries, uh, like Sweden, where they banned asbestos many decades ago, what they really saw so far is that they're more still up in the plateauing. It certainly is not that mesothelioma is going to drop down back to nothing. Um, because there is so much asbestos in the environment, uh, we know it's going to take a much longer time uh, to have that go away. Uh, but still, at least, what we hope is that uh, the increases in the rates of mesothelioma that we've been observing for decades uh, in Canada are finally going to, uh, uh, going to uh, uh, come to an end. And uh, although the problem will be with us for many decades, maybe we can hope that this is eventually going to, uh, going to uh, end. I'm just going to pause there if anybody has any, any questions. Yes. In, in using perhaps even the case of Sweden where they had been banned uh, decades ago, as you said, have there been any, uh, is there any data that would suggest, uh, I'm going to say secondary exposure, perhaps on the renovation side of, of uh, uh, retrofitting older buildings or renovating homes that, that they are able to trace um, uh, cases of mesothelioma to those, that, those particular activities? It's very hard to trace it back to specific activities, but yeah, that's the, that's the presumption that they've got, is that it is happening just from all that asbestos that exists in, in buildings. Uh, to my knowledge, they haven't, I think they've been a little bit more active in removal, but, but still, I like to tell people that when I trained to be a hygienist in the mid-1980s, I thought asbestos was an old issue back then. Um, I thought, well, why are we spending so much time on this? I mean, come on, uh, we know about this. Um, and at the time, there was the idea that removal is going to generate more harm than good, and that we should just gradually remove as, as the problem arises. But meantime, it is 30 years later. The buildings are 30 years older, and we still haven't removed. Um, uh, so I think it's a it's a thing we have to revisit and think about if we want to prevent this. But um, my friends in the Nordic countries believe it is from, uh, from those things, but they hope that uh, it's going to be eventually uh, decreasing. But it wasn't, uh, um, they haven't seen the kind of dramatic drop off that they were hoping for there. But again, with things like mesothelioma, the action can happen in terms of causing cancer many decades in the past. So it's really hard to put it down to uh, specific situations for where people were exposed. Uh, yes, in the back. I was on, um, there, I guess there's two questions there. I don't have good data on that. Uh, it certainly is the case not just here, but in, in many parts of the country. I was on a, a committee for the International Agency for Research on Cancer looking at asbestos about, uh, I guess about seven years ago now. And there was a large debate there about um, about stomach and colorectal cancer, and I was, I, you know, the epidemiologist in the room, and I'm an epidemiologist uh, as well as an occupational hygienist, and we were saying, yes, 
this, these are, there is an increased risk among people who've been highly exposed to asbestos. Um, but we were unable to convince the pathologists and uh, the toxicologists of this, so it was a split vote. But part of the thing that, uh, the problem that they had was that when you feed animals enormous amounts of asbestos, they don't get stomach cancer. Um, what you get is, but when you have animals inhale asbestos fibers, they get mesothelioma uh, the same way we do. Um, so they don't think things are coming through the stomach. Um, and one of the theories is that instead it may be passing through the lungs and in the same way that we get mesothelioma in the lining of the, uh, uh, of the, the uh, stomach cavity uh, as well as the, uh, uh, the, you know, um, the pleura surrounding the lungs, that may be the root of exposure. But we still don't know why that is. So it's always been a question about then what's the hazard of drinking water? And we've put, I think, regulations. Now, I didn't put them, but somebody put them. I think on the basis of being cautionary because it is not a good thing uh, to have asbestos start appearing in, in drinking water. That water is going to dry someplace. Those fibers are going to then uh, be left uh, on some surface. Uh, so I think that that's bad. Uh, but the actual in the water themselves, I'm not sure what the hazard is associated with that. And at this point, I don't think anybody has, uh, there certainly isn't a lot of good evidence to say that in the water itself it's a problem. So I know that that's probably not a satisfactory answer, but that's kind of where the, the science is at this point uh, about the hazards of that. Uh, it still is a concern, and it certainly is one of the areas where we've had a lot of asbestos in there. It strengthens our larger pipes, which is why it was still being used in piping for a long time. There's another hand here. They removed, yeah. But you, you look at the cost, you, you reference the cost of this. Do you believe the calculation is as basically as good as uh, the actual removal? Yeah, that's a tough question. Um, you know, the problem is that the encapsulation eventually wears, wears out. Um, we have uh, asbestos in a lot of materials, um, any, anywhere from tiles that you walk on to ceiling tiles and things like that. How effective encapsulation is every place, I'm not really sure. There are places where encapsulation, I think, can be effective, uh, but I'm not sure it's effective everywhere. Um, but my concern is just when there's a lot of it out there and we're gradually wearing out over time, we have to be a lot more vigilant and a lot more proactive in looking for that um, than I think we have been um, and assuming that um, we can just visually inspect and, and see that things are not there. Uh, in the case of, of the um, uh, asbestos that was in, um, you know, in the, you know, basically the, the wrapping around pipes, that was actually removed. Uh, and that's, that is an area where I guess they could have encapsulated, and I think the idea was that it would have been more effective to, uh, to simply remove that, and they thought that that, would be the, that wouldn't be as uh, expensive as ripping out whole materials. Um, so they did actively go out and get rid of that in those schools. They just eliminated it then. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, no other activities were taken that I'm aware of. Any other uh, questions? Here's another one. You mentioned custodial workers as part of the people that had exposure. I just out of curiosity, are you aware of anything that has to do with waste haulers? So uh, say the companies do their thing, and then they get dumped into roll-off containers, and they get taken to a landfill, and they get buried, and blah, blah, blah. But uh, just out of curiosity, are you aware of any statistics or any information related directly to waste haulers? I just find they get kind of forgotten the garbage so it gets forgotten. Uh, yeah, and I'm, and I'm going to 
I'm going to move on to some other topics here, and one of them is going to be uh, what we need to do for prevention. And I think the handling of waste is something that we have to think about very seriously, and, and uh, I'm not alone in that. A problem is getting statistics on, um, and I'll show you some statistics that we've generated on where cases are arising uh, currently in Ontario. The problem is we have to rely upon the current coding systems for occupation, and they don't capture some of the groups like that very well at all. Um, and that's a problem. Uh, um, I have a problem with that. I also have a problem with uh, often our reporting requirements now. Uh, you know, having one or two cases is important from as being a signal that there's a problem there. Uh, but being in an agency where I have to, I can't have reporting requirements that don't allow me to report on things that are too small. But I'll get, we'll get back to that uh, point when I get back to prevention. Just thought I've kind of inundated people with statistics, so it'd be a good idea to give people a little bit of a break. So I'll continue on, um, and. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, about compensation for uh, cancer and uh, in, uh, in Canada. Um, here's compensated, this is just a graph of compensated cancer claims and what's happened with them over time um, in Canada. Now there was a, probably about uh, in the mid 2000s in Canada, the number of cancer claims surpassed the number of traumatic injury. Uh, these are fatal claims, I'm sorry, I should be saying, uh, claims in the country uh, overall. Um, and the, the, the number of those claims is, is quite high. So the solid bars here for, can or for cancer claims are solid lines. And the similarly colored dashed line is for the number of fatals uh, fatal uh, injuries uh, in the same provinces, and these are by year. Um, so you see uh, Alberta, BC, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, and Saskatchewan. Um, now, what you see here is that in, uh, now these are just from the AWCBC, which is perhaps not always, uh, doesn't always reflect uh, exactly what's going on in the, in the provinces, but um, uh, what you do see here is in the manufacturing provinces where we have less fatal injuries, we have a lot more fatal cancers. Um, and those certainly are kind of bouncing around because the number of, of cancers compensated isn't the number of cancers that actually exist. It's the number of cancers that are first recognized by uh, in a physician's office usually uh, or by the worker themselves and brought to the attention. Uh, a claim has to be submitted and then a claim has to be accepted. So there's a series of, of steps there. Um, but uh, just to give you an idea of where those are. Now if I move to um, compensated mesotheliomas, uh, and um, versus all cancers, uh, what you can see is that mesotheliomas make up a substantial number or percentage of the cancers uh, overall. And this is a bit messy. Um, I'd hope that it would come out a bit clearer. Uh, and maybe when I have a chance, I'll try to do some kind of smoothing exercises here. Uh, but I wanted to show you that. And the reason that the Saskatchewan line is slow near the bottom. It's these reporting requirements that we have that don't allow us to report anything less than the numbers of five. But when we look overall, what you see is that roughly 50% of all uh, cancer claims, accepted cancer claims in Canada, are mesotheliomas. Um, now that perhaps is not surprising. Uh, mesotheliomas are almost, you know, or the great majority are due to workplace exposures. Um, most people know that. I like to say that uh, um, our medical education around cancer isn't great and the causes of cancer, but if there's one thing that I expect physicians to know is that mesothelioma is caused by asbestos and that they should ask their patient about it. Um, but still about 50% of uh, mesotheliomas are compensated. That's um, uh, lower in places like Ontario, but you can see the huge number of cancer claims that we uh, compensate in Ontario. This is over uh, about a 12-year uh, uh, oh, period, I guess. 
Um, so you see a very large number of claims. Uh, but you can see it's similar in a lot of areas of Canada that it's the major component of uh, compensated claims. Now I can actually look, uh, the WSIB has given me very uh, easy access to the submitted claims as well as the accepted claims. Uh, and you could also see that asbestos claims have a much higher uh, acceptance rate uh, in Ontario. I don't know what they are here. I don't know how many claims are submitted here. Uh, but over 60% of, of submitted asbestos claims are accepted in Ontario. Uh, overall, only about 40% of all cancer claims are accepted. Um, this is excluding firefighters. Uh, Firefighters are in their own unique category because of this presumptive legislation that's happened in Ontario and a lot of provinces, but in case you're wondering, uh, firefighters overall have a better acceptance rate uh, than anybody else. Uh, so this is not including firefighters. But you look at all of the claims accepted and it's only about 20%. And so again, this is, this is Ontario. And uh, you see the 63% for asbestos, uh, if people submit a skin cancer claim for uh, exposure to sun for outdoor workers, it's not a huge number of claims they're submitted, but they seem to do pretty well. Uh, crystalline silica, a well-recognized cause of, of uh, lung cancer, uh, down closer to 50%, and so on going down the line. This is just to say that we're doing a better job of compensating uh, claims for uh, asbestos, um, but I still think that with claims we're only, we can't really use claims to be representative of the problem of asbestos related uh, cancers. We have to look really at the number of, the true number of cancers being generated because the compensation system is not, is not really capturing uh, all of those claims. Now, in order to get a better handle of the, on this, we have tried to start a number of surveillance projects in, uh, in Ontario. Um, this is our website if anybody is interested, um, but Occupational Disease Surveillance Program should probably get you there if you include the word Ontario in there. And we have several different things. So some of our work on mesothelioma is going to be posted here. It's not yet because it's uh, brand new. Um, has some, some of this has not been uh, presented yet. But one of the things we're trying to do is to look at where are the cases of uh, mesothelioma currently arising. Overall, in all, in all workers and not just folks who are presenting claims. And so we've tried to generate statistics on that. Um, and we set up a system which has occupational information on about 2 million people in the province of Ontario. Um, so it's a pretty large system and it allows us to really look at a variety of things. Uh, but we're actually trying to work now with other provinces to set up similar types of systems. And we think if we can actually uh, work in parallel, we might be able to get a better idea of what's going on across the country. But probably no surprise to anybody is, uh, and I'm going to say that, um, I'm just going to walk over to the screen here and point at things and kind of speak loud. So at the bottom here is what's called the hazard ratio. For those of you who are used to things being presented as relative risks, a hazard ratio is a type of relative risk where one is the same risk, in this case, of all workers uh, in this system of two million people, and two would be twice the risk uh, compared to all. Oh, is that a pointer? Yeah. Ooh, thank you. I still will stand here because it's, oh. I should point. <laughs> it's all about me. Okay. So you can see here um, we have construction workers that are certainly at the high level. Our, our mine and quarry workers, that's largely being driven by our asbestos miners, of which we have hardly any in this system. Uh, but uh, they still have mesotheliomas, but that's why these lines, which represent 95% confidence limits, are so wide. The numbers are small, but they're there. Public administration and defense, 
That's because of all the asbestos that we've been using in our public buildings. Um, and we used a lot. We used a lot in our hospitals. We used a lot uh, in our schools. This was supposed to be a safety measure um, to prevent these buildings from burning. But in fact, uh, we're seeing the aftermath of that now. And you see, and so on. So this is just an example of what we have up on our website. But we also have some more specific numbers. And I will show you some of those now. So again, you see the hazard ratios here. I'm speaking loud enough for everyone? OK. This doesn't uh, create a problem for you on this little mic, no? OK, good. Um, it's going to probably sound like shouting on the little mic now. Uh, but what you see here are some of the construction trades and some of the classic groups uh, and what their risk of, um, of mesothelioma is. Uh, and so you see. Um, construction electricians. Uh, foremen may strike you as kind of odd, but in fact, people who are foremen in the construction trades, they're former construction workers, and they were, had different trades themselves. It just happened that when they entered our system, they were already uh, in that foreman level. Uh, carpenters, brick masons, uh, plasters having a high level, painters. Insulating occupations, many of you may know, or some of you may know, that the insulators union used to be called the Asbestos Workers Union in Canada. Uh, and you see that they have 27 times the risk of mesothelioma as other workers in this system of 2 million uh, folks. Plumbers and pipe fitters, boiler makers, also very, very high risk groups. So the value of this is that we're able to actually uh, quantify what the risks are in some of these specific groups. Uh, and these are not based upon claims data, but based upon looking at people who were employed in high hazard occupations, following them over time, and seeing what kind of diseases that they develop. Here you see some other groups, and maybe ones that we don't always think about. These are basically mechanics and repairs of heavy duty equipment, industrial, farm, and construction. You may have remembered that I said we used a lot of asbestos in friction materials. Well, those folks would have been maintaining those brakes and other things. Uh, they would have been working in uh, large industrial facilities uh, where they may have encountered these things as well. Uh, stationary engine, engine and equipment operators. Um, uh, here are people in metal machining, uh, welding and flame cutting, uh, material handling. Now, this is just based upon occupation. Um, when we actually look at industry, a lot of these folks were employed in our iron and steel mills, our foundries, our boiler and plate works. These are all what I would call our hot industries. And in our hot industries, where there's a lot of fire and flame, we used a lot of asbestos around materials uh, to keep those, uh, uh, the heat away, to prevent fires and things like that. The, aftermath of that is that there is asbestos in those industries, um, uh, chemical industry as well, um, electric power. And something that people may uh, not find too surprising, giving a few of the statements that I've mentioned before, universities and colleges and education and related services. Um, Although you might see an occasional case of mesothelioma in a teacher, the people that are in our system uh, are actually people in high hazard occupations. We have their occupation and industry information because they got injured at work and then entered our system and then we followed them afterward for the development of diseases. These aren't teachers. These are the custodians and the skill trades that maintain our educational uh, facilities, where we used a lot of that asbestos over time. And you see that they have an increased risk. Now, you see a very similar pattern for asbestosis. Uh, you may remember that I said that we don't have a great uh, track record of, or we don't have a good you know, record of really following asbestosis in the general population in Canada. Um, cancer is a bit strange as a disease. Uh, 
it's very useful to be a person who studies cancer that we have tumor registries in every province that try to identify when people are newly diagnosed with cancer. And we've had those uh, um, well, in Ontario since the mid-1960s uh, and across the country uh, since uh, the late 60s, early 70s, we've been able to track that. But we don't have that for other diseases. So um, what we have here are, uh, um, in this case, we're looking at people who are appearing uh, in, uh, by looking at their outpatient records. Uh, they were seen for um, asbestosis at least twice. Uh, we want to make sure that we're actually capturing real cases. Um, and, uh, but what you see is a lot of the same groups that are at increased risk for uh, one are at increased risk for the other. And by that, I mean mesothelioma and asbestosis. So these are people who clearly had an increased uh, risk of being exposed to asbestos. And again, we see many of these other groups, uh, including pulp and paper mills, uh, sheet metal workers, and other folks uh, that were exposed. Now, mesothelioma is... Uh, an unusual disease in that what we have with mesothelioma is if you expose a lot of people to low levels of asbestos, you're going to get cases of mesothelioma. Um, it doesn't take a lot to cause that. The risk may not be huge, but when you expose tens or hundreds of thousands of people to low levels, you're going to still get cases of mesothelioma over time. Asbestosis is from higher levels of exposure to uh, asbestos. And so we see a slightly different pattern that we're going to see here. Uh, but these are people who are regularly exposed to asbestos uh, in their work and probably had higher levels of, of, uh, of exposure. But still, we see uh, some of these educational groups. Uh, we also see electric power. And we see some industries where we might not necessarily have a priori or uh, without thinking about it, thought that they would have exposure to asbestos. This is why it's important to try to track this kind of information in the population so we know where this exposure is occurring. We can't prevent these diseases. They already occurred. But we can look to make sure that people aren't still being exposed to asbestos there now and try to prevent cases in the future. Maybe I'll stop sharting now. But you see here the, just the side by side of asbestosis and mesothelioma um, that you see here. And many of these groups are at increased risk of lung cancer as well. Uh, um, one group here which you'll see is our asbestos miners. And I said that we had small but very nasty asbestos mines in Ontario. Uh, and they had 260 times the risk. There's only about 100 asbestos miners that are even in the system that we have because those asbestos mines closed so many years ago. Um, uh, but even then, they meet our reporting requirements of having over five cases amongst that 100 people that were exposed there. And uh, in the case of mesothelioma, there was also an increased risk of asbestosis, but they didn't meet that reporting requirement. Um, uh, so I can't give you any numbers on that. Uh, but just to say that, uh, indeed, our asbestos mines were quite nasty in Ontario. OK, now that I've kind of hopefully uh, gotten everybody worried about asbestos-related disease um, and the fact that it's not going away, uh, one thing we can do and we can look forward to now is prevention. Um, and uh, what you see here is uh, the kind of uh, call for, uh, you know, when they actually were announcing the ban on asbestos. So this is before the actual ban occurred. This is early uh, last year, 2018. Um, one thing that we're relatively happy about is is whoop, when you, I'm probably pointing it around the same area. This may be too small for you to see, but the asbestos ban actually quotes our numbers for the number of asbestos-related cancers. 
we actually pushed to put out those numbers early on uh, in order to push for the ban on asbestos. So we're quite happy when that ban occurred, and that's the power of statistics when you can generate them and put them to good use uh, to push for asbestos. Um, they quoted not only our numbers of cases being generated, but uh, the economic uh, costs of those. And I've just pulled up their cost benefits statement here. And yes, please. Mm -hmm. Do you find that there's, um, or what percentage do you think would be cases where there's concomitant issues, where there's uh, people suffering from both conditions, or is that are they more or less exclusive? Or? I don't know. I haven't looked at that. Um, and we could, just to see what it is. You know, there are some places like uh, British Columbia where they, in order to compensate a lung cancer in British Columbia, they want to see that you have uh, asbestosis or pleural plaques or some other kind of thing like that, or that you're a non-smoker. So they set the bar very high for the compensation of lung <coughs> cancer there. So it'd be interesting to see how many folks we actually see in the records as having that, but we, we actually haven't looked at that yet. Um, we, uh, we don't see huge numbers because we set a pretty high bar for our asbestosis cases, um, we're not seeing huge numbers there, so we're not seeing, I think, as broad a number as we've seen when I've looked at it in, in, uh, in British Columbia. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? He did the right thing by, by getting my attention. So I'll, uh, I'll leave this up here for a second, um, and uh, hopefully it'll be okay with our camera person over there who's filming this, which always makes me a bit nervous that I don't like, you know, do some strange thing up here. Uh, but let me go over here and point to this economic impact statement. Now, they were trying to assess whether or not, you know, what the cost was of the ban, which is not particularly substantial, and they wanted some economic justification. So they contacted uh, Emil Tampa, my uh, collaborating economist from the Institute for Work and Health, and I to say, well, if we made a statement like this that uh, eventually we'll pre be preventing five cases per year of asbestos-related cancer, is that reasonable? And Emil and I said, yeah, that's reasonable. So the problem is here that uh, eventually we're going to be is preventing a lot of cases of asbestos-related disease with this ban, but it takes decades for that to happen. And in the meantime, we're preventing a very small number of cases with the ban, and that's why we have to concentrate on other types of prevention. Uh, we're only going to capture really a very small number. So um, you see here on average, they said 5.3 cases of uh, asbestos-related uh, cancer per year are enough to justify the ban. Um, and yet it took us decades to come up with a ban in Canada. So um, it's a bit depressing, uh, but still it's the reason we have to still think about, about prevention. Okay, back to the mic. Um, some of you who are in occupational health and prevention will know what we call the hierarchy of controls. That is, what's the best way to prevent? Um, prevent something is to uh, totally eliminate the hazard at the top, uh, substitute it out, uh, use engineering controls or administrative controls if it's already happening, uh, or the last resort, which is use some kind of personal protective equipment like a respirator. So the ban basically works up here, which is a great thing. Uh, the problem is that the asbestos is already in uh, the environment. Um, and because of that, we're really stuck with still looking at engineering controls and administrative controls, and then as a last resort, worrying about personal protective equipment. Now, in our burden of cancer report that just came out uh, in the last few weeks, 
Um, and uh, there's a handout with uh, some of the pages from it that deal with asbestos, but the full report is available online. It's over 100 pages, and I didn't want to. Uh, uh, we really have just put it out as an electronic report uh, for now. Um, one of the recommendations we make is to establish a public registry of all public buildings and workplaces that contain asbestos. Now, Saskatchewan is one of the few places in the country that actually has a registry of public buildings. But what we believe is that we've got to go beyond that uh, and really uh, try to get, at the very least, all workplaces and ideally all places where asbestos is in place. Uh, so that whenever a worker goes into a situation, they're aware that their asbestos is there. Um, I mean, that's only the first step to prevention, but it's a necessary step. If we don't know it's there, it's going to be hard to prevent. Um, another one of our recommendations here was, and it's something that uh, British Columbia has uh, done, is they've established some kind of an interministerial working group uh, to look at this because it is more than just a problem for our ministries of labor. Um, it's our, uh, and I know our ministries of labor go by various names, uh, but it's our ministries of environment, uh, our public health authorities. It really has to be across a lot of different authorities uh, where we're dealing with things uh, like the hazardous waste issues that was brought up earlier uh, today um, and other types of issues where we're dealing with uh, exposures in homes and things like that. Um, so we do need to, uh, I think, take a more comprehensive look at this. And I'm going to talk about some kind of some of the other recommendations that have come out of an organization called um, Asbestos Free Canada. I'm just going to look here. Oh, and I seem to have been, I don't know. I'm just going to look at my, I'm not checking for text messages. Okay, just wanted to see if I'm going too long, but I'm coming to an end here. So hopefully uh, I'll be done in a few minutes and then we can have time for more questions and discussion. Um, Asbestos Free Canada is an advocacy group and uh, as an employee of the province of Ontario, um, I'm not a member, but as a professor of the University of British Columbia and a professor at the University of uh, Toronto, I am a member of Asbestos Free Canada. Uh, and so we're coming out with a series of recommendations for how to uh, reduce exposure because prevention is so important here. And now that the ban is in place, uh, a lot of the groups that uh, push for the ban are trying to coalesce around pushing for more prevention. Um, the first element of the strategy is this thing of trying to document exposure, you know, where exposure uh, or where asbestos is present, its condition, uh, and then also try to identify where exposed people are uh, and what their health conditions are. These are recommendations that really stem right out of the International Labor Organization and the World Health Organization's recommendations on establishing a comprehensive program for the prevention of asbestos-related disease that have been around for decades as recommendations from the World Health Organization. Um, so hardly radical, but something that we have to start thinking about. Now that we've gotten over the fact that we shouldn't be, that we should actually ban asbestos, we've got to move on. Um, trying to think about the safe and effective elimination is another element that is very important to have uh, in a strategy going forward. Um, uh, we can talk about encapsulation where uh, that's the best option, but I think we also start to think about um, how do we eventually eliminate and safely dispose of that. Um, now, an issue that is important in places like Quebec is a thing that is called just transition for affected workers. Uh, that is people who were employed in asbestos related uh, mines and things like that uh, should be able to find employment elsewhere. Not so much of an issue in other parts of the country. Um, Health care and compensation for asbestos related disease is also an important element. Um, and as well Something that we're asking our federal government to do uh, is to take 
uh, is to kind of switch from where in the past we used to be um, uh, people who would oppose the inclusion of asbestos as part of the Rotterdam Convention. Uh, the Rotterdam Convention requires that uh, countries uh, who um, uh, import asbestos have to say that we recognize the harms of asbestos in doing that. It's hardly radical. It's one of the international conventions, but Canada was opposing it for decades. Now we're supporting it, uh, so we're on the right side of it. Uh, but there are a lot of things like that that we could be doing internationally, and we have to live up to the fact that although we've had fairly limited use of asbestos here since the mid-1970s, We've been exporting it to Indonesia and Bangladesh and India uh, during those same periods. Uh, and we have to own up to our responsibility in those areas where they're going to be having their own epidemics of asbestos-related disease uh, in the future. So these are the recommendations that um, are coming out of Asbestos-Free Canada that are more specific. Uh, they are calling for the establishment of a federal asbestos agency uh, kind of based on the Australian model. Now, in Australia, they do have a, a, a national agency like this uh, that is trying to deal with asbestos-related diseases and prevention. Um, Australia also has, uh, the states in Australia have jurisdiction, so there's, it has a similar model to us that there's a, here we have a bit of really occupational health is under provincial jurisdiction and where's the role for the federal government in this? Well, there is a role for this in a national government and we think that it should be playing more of a role uh, in preventing, preventing this um, and taking responsibility since we supported as a federal uh, government the use of asbestos, the continued mining of asbestos for years uh, that should be, uh, that reverse responsibility should happen. Um, we do need to have a long-term strategy uh, for the removal uh, of asbestos, um, starting with places where it's already in poor condition and likely to cause harm. Um, we need to ensure the protection of workers and the public during the removal of asbestos is a, another area. Um, and. Uh, another thing which uh, is not so much an issue, uh, Saskatchewan is one of the uh, few provinces in the country that actually has uh, Alara, you know, uh, uh, treats uh, asbestos as an Alara uh, thing as low as reasonably achievable levels of exposure. Um, that's not true in most of the provinces of the country and in fact, uh, we're finally coming up to the point where uh, the federal government and the Quebec government are lowering their allowable levels, but they were allowing 10 times the level of asbestos in the air as uh, recommended by the ACGIH uh, for decades, because to acknowledge that all forms of asbestos equally cause uh, cancer would have been to say that they were being hypocritical. So. They were hypocritical in the other direction. Um, and hopefully we're going to get a leveling of asbestos protection in terms of workplace exposure levels that's going to happen across the country. But this is one where Saskatchewan is already there. Um, these are some other recommendations. And uh, I just would put up here a little self-serving that we need to develop a comprehensive research framework. Uh, uh, being a researcher, I don't say more about that. Uh, we, a problem that we do have is that we have compensation in this country for people who have workplace exposure, but not people who were exposed environmentally. Um, and that impacts uh, disproportionately uh, people who were, had family members uh, who were exposed to asbestos and that later develop asbestos-related disease. There is no compensation for them at this point in time. Uh, or their survivors. Uh, another uh, group is people in First Nations uh, um, and other indigenous people who lived in public housing where in public housing we used a lot of asbestos over time uh, and they're also suffering from asbestos related disease uh, disproportionately. So we do need uh, compensation um, uh, to happen there. Um, 
And we do need to have better collaboration, I think, across the different compensation agencies uh, in this country to make sure that when a claim is filed in one province, even if it was due to exposure in another, that there's correct handling of that and efficient treatment. When people come in, particularly for uh, mesothelioma, but it's true for lung cancer as well, uh, they're not going to be living long and their problems, you know, their families are dealing with enough. Uh, as it is, uh, we should be a lot more compassionate in how we treat uh, compensation. Uh, for a while, I know uh, British Columbia actually had an ombudsperson to help with, uh, with this, uh, with compensation cases for uh, mesothelioma. I'm not sure if that's still going on. I'm trying to uh, uh, figure that out right now. But that was a very compassionate way to approach this. So. I am going to conclude now. This has been a long presentation. Uh, that's why I wanted to take at least a few breaks for uh, questions along the way. Um, we have a very sad legacy of asbestos in this country. Uh, things are improving in that area, um, uh, but we still have a huge health impact from past exposure, uh, and it's going to be with us uh, for decades to come. The ban on asbestos was an important step, but it really is just a first step. Uh, we have a lot more to do on prevention, um, and uh, that's going to be a very substantial challenge to us uh, uh, in the decades to come, but one that is very important if we're going to uh, get ahead of preventing asbestos-related disease. Um, some places require conflicts of interest statements. Uh, I don't really have any conflicts of interest statements, so this is kind of our, my, actually my acknowledgement slide. Uh, again, to our core funders, uh, some of the research that we do, uh, particularly in surveillance, is funded also by the Public Health Agency of Canada, um, as well as by our Ministry of Health. Uh, and uh, the WSIB and other organizations. So um, I could be thanking a lot of different organizations, but I also need to thank uh, the staff and students and other researchers affiliated with our center. So I'll end there. Thank you very much for your long attention. Thank you. Before we move to questions, I want to remind folks that uh, we, we are filming the presentation in the Q&A uh, session just for the benefit of people who are unable to make it today, so know that this uh, will be made publicly available at a later time. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Yes, please. I'm sorry, reporting requirements for? In your earlier slide. I mean, I, I, I've covered a lot of different things. Was that <coughs> for? Um, I'm just thinking in terms of, um, I think it was like less than five cases. That oh, sorry, yeah. That's under our privacy kind of legislation. And our, our yeah, while in general I'm supportive of privacy legislation, I don't think anybody ever expected that privacy legislation would actually conflict with uh, would, would actually decrease benefits of things. It's more to prevent, prevent individuals' privacy. I wish at times that I didn't have those restrictions, um, uh, but uh, certainly I face them in uh, a lot of different places now, and it's kind of our new reality. Um, I don't oppose them in principle, but it would be nice if they were, uh, if there were ways to, uh, when we're dealing with things where we're talking about the pr pr you know, protection of public uh, good, uh, that we didn't have to worry that we're giving some numbers out. Never, never would I present anything that anybody could be identified individually on, um, but the kind of arbitrary cutoff of five cases is too few um, doesn't seem to me to be based in science or ethics. It's a matter of convenience for those, that legislation, and for that reason I am uncomfortable with it. Yes, please. Back into 
you know, uh, they're aware of it and they're trying to do it. I'm not, I'm not sure of what specific things they're doing this year to actually, other than saying that we're not importing that. A problem is that brake pads come in and they don't have a, a label on them that says contains asbestos, which is the problem then when they go into our uh, auto repair shops, somebody opens a box, they don't know. Uh, whether they have asbestos or not. Uh, there certainly will be more caution in looking at that, uh, but I think it's one, an area that we have to have some continued vigilance on. And it's an area where I, when I looked at how much we're spending or how much they think that this is going to, the ban is going to cost, it surprised me that it was costing uh, as little as it is because to really be vigilant on uh, asbestos containing materials that come in on unlabeled products. Uh, I think can be more expensive than what they're actually anticipating. And there certainly are, uh, in the past, some toys have come into Canada with asbestos in the toys. Uh, and crazy stuff happens in, in these kind of unlabeled products that are coming in, uh, cheap goods from other countries, basically. So it's an area that I think is a legitimate area of concern. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we do manufacture brake pads in Canada, and I know that those don't contain asbestos. They're a little bit more expensive. They're not that much more expensive. Uh, I would recommend, I would recommend going in that direction until we're sure of what we're importing. Yes, please. Yeah, and I think where we're going to see the stronger signal is in, again, the same way we've seen it in education, in looking at uh, people who are custodians and people who are maintaining the buildings. I haven't pulled out healthcare uh, specifically, but it's an area that I'd like to look at. Um, I'm not sure if we'll have the numbers, but it certainly is something uh, that if any place has the numbers, it'll be Ontario where we've got uh, pretty large numbers of people in there. Um, again, we haven't seen it even though we knew it was in schools. We don't necessarily pull it up in teachers so much, but we do, uh, we do in, in the, uh, the trades and, and uh, the custodians. So um, I think that that's a good, a good area for me to look at so that we uh, certainly see that there. I know that even Cancer Care Ontario, our headquarters, is in Princess Margaret Hospital. And when I go to see my boss and meet in her office, she's not allowed to hang pictures on her walls because there's asbestos behind those walls and you can't put a nail into a wall in the hospital because of that. So it is certainly a problem across, this, uh, across the country. Well, I'm pretty sure. I mean, we certainly have uh, remediation uh, laws in place in jurisdictions across Canada. I'll, I could let somebody here who knows Saskatchewan better. You know, the problem, the, the, I think that one of the areas that worries me is uh, 
homes where people might not be getting uh, real licensed asbestos remediation, remediators uh, and uh, smaller businesses where they might also, or people doing it themselves. Uh, but uh, if people are doing it legally, they would be using at least licensed people uh, in the jurisdictions that I'm aware of, but I don't know the laws here. Uh, if somebody who's from, uh, from here and knows the laws in Saskatchewan would want to answer that, I'd appreciate it. But I will say that you know, it's you know having regulations in place and reality in place is is kind of a different thing. The University of Toronto, not your small employer, major employer, screwed up royally a few years ago. They got a lot of money from the province to update labs in the medical sciences building. And the medical sciences building is a building with about a thousand. Um, people working in it, a mix of paid staff, graduate students, faculty, um, and uh, they, had, they were updating that building, but part of that updating uh, involved uh, things that were releasing asbestos from um, the walls and other things like that. They hired a company. They were trying to cut corners because they were trying to spend as many, as high a proportion of those dollars as possible on buying new fancy scientific equipment. Um, for updating those labs. Uh, and they did things like uh, tell uh, some of the workers, but for instance, they missed the cleaning staff altogether. They didn't tell the cleaning staff. Uh, um, they told some of the QP workers. They didn't tell the union representing the graduate students who are working in those labs. So you can get major screw ups. And um, uh, now I don't. Now, they were doing a lot of measurements concurrently. It's not that people were exposed to very high levels, but they could have been. You know, you have to really uh, be monitoring these things closely and, um, you know, do as rigorous a uh, uh, try as possible. And so when this came out that they had really not informed people as the law had required, um, they only got a hand slap. Uh, in terms of that, but then they turned around and hired uh, the best consulting company uh, to monitor the situation um, in, you know, uh, from then, that point going forward and I think did a much better job. Uh, so it's something we continually have to make uh, and pay attention to. Um, Sean? I haven't yet, but it's not necessarily that everybody, not necessarily true that everybody would let me know. Um, it's something I think um, we want to be monitoring now, and I'll be talking with people about. Um, you know, the focus in the last couple of years was on the on the ban overall, um, and we recognize that things were uneven in different areas across the country. Uh, but I don't know of any organization that's been monitoring that. Uh, it's something that. I think could be done by uh, the federal labor program, uh, but there's been a reluctance to get into the business of being seen as, as interfering with provincial jurisdiction, so they've not wanted to, to do that. It's one of these negative aspects of, of uh, that that we don't necessarily uh, hear about these things. There is an organization called Kalosh. Um, where there is communication between the provinces on policies and other things like that. Uh, I'm hoping that it's also being discussed there. Uh, there's another hand that I missed. Yes. Uh, 
Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, it's it's a challenging area to regulate this, uh, and it's uh, but I think it's a very important one because it is the major one of the major sources of exposure going forward is going to be uh, you know the gradual repair and, and updating and taking down of buildings. Any other uh, questions or comments? I'll I'll uh, be around uh, for the for a while if people want to come up and talk with me. Uh, before I get uh, pulled away for some other uh, things going on today. So thank you very much, everybody, for your attention. Paul, Paul I just want to oh, want to thank you again for, for coming all this way. I know you were just out in Charlottetown speaking to the AWCBC uh, meetings there. And uh, thank you very much for taking the time to this. Paul is also speaking at the University of Regina this afternoon on the burden of uh, occupational cancer. Uh, it's in room uh, 514 in the education building, and that will be from 2 until 3.30. Okay, and if, if uh, you need any further information on that, come and see me after the talk. Thanks again, Paul. Thank you. Thanks.